We are doing a series at the moment on the royals. And we are looking at the kings of Israel and Judah. And leading up to today's message, over the past few weeks, I've been thinking about this and praying about it. And to be honest, it's a, it's a tricky one to teach on because what we're trying to do is pull out the lessons that we learned from the kings. And today, we're looking at King Solomon. Now, what, what's Solomon known for? Lots of, lots of wives, yes. Being wise. Being wise. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, I thought you said wives. My, oh. Lots of wise. Either or. Uh, <clears throat> so to get up, it's a little bit precocious to get up here and say, let me teach you lessons that we get from the wisest person who ever lived. Oh, that's dangerous ground. So what we're going to do is we're going to look through his story and we're going to let the Bible pull out the things that we want to learn, we need to learn from this. Now there's a whole bunch more we could, we could pull from here and I encourage you to read the story because it is pretty fascinating. Um, but if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to 1 Kings. And we're going to be exploring this as we go. Last week, Jared preached about David, and we had a bit of a, um, yeah, an overview of some different stories in David's life. David is getting old, and he, um, we find out that one of his other sons sees an opportunity, jumps up and goes, hey, I want to be king. And so he sneaks away, grabs a few people, and gets himself self-anointed as king, um, kind of like a coup. David hears about this through Bathsheba and the prophet um, Nathan. And Bathsheba goes, hey, you promised Solomon? You promised my boy would be king? And he said, yes, I did. We're going to follow through with that. So he makes Solomon king. Now, we don't know what age Solomon is at this point. We don't know if he's young, if he's in his teenage years, if he's in his 20s. But there's a good chance he, he is actually probably, probably in his teens. Um, we're not sure, but we get that by when we see what David says to him. So David gets Solomon in and he says this, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So be strong, act like a man and observe what the Lord your God requires. Now, that's why I think maybe Solomon was a little bit young. Because David's like, hey, let, let me give you some advice here of what, what you need to do. I want you to act like a man. Now, we hear that and we go, okay, so what's he going to do? He's going to learn how to lead the army. He's going to learn how to fight. He's going to get tough. He's going to get serious on his enemies. But what does David actually say? What does it look like to, to act like a man, to be strong? Walk in obedience to God. Keep his decrees and his commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Now, you would not expect a king to sell his son, especially in that era. I want you to act like a man. I want you to be tough. And how you do that is by obeying God. Like generally, it'd be a very different story. But I think if you take nothing else from today, if you want to act like a man, it means obeying God. That's what David says, a man after God's heart. You want, to be, you want to be mature? You want to be someone who is worthy in the world, someone who makes a difference? David's advice is pretty clear. Obey God. Follow his decrees, follow his laws, follow his commands. And so he does that. And we keep reading and we get to chapter 3 of First Kings. And Solomon acts like a man, and he goes and gets himself a wife. And not just any wife, he gets one of the daughters of Pharaoh. So he finds an Egyptian wife, he brings her back, and at this point, I wonder if this is where he wrote Song of Songs. He's found this woman, and she just captivates him, and she is everything to him, and so he writes this book that explains his book of poetry kind of just explains his love for her and her love for him 
Now, we don't know if that's true. This is just my interpretation. This is not what the Bible says. But I wonder if at that point, Solomon's in this place where he is obeying God. He's found himself a lovely wife. And he's like, oh, this king stuff is good. Like, I could get used to this. And it says that Solomon showed his love for the Lord by well, doing what his dad said. By walking according to the instructions given to him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Now, what does that mean? Well, maybe it means that there was no place for them to worship God centrally. And so they did it where they could. Maybe it means there's a little bit of them doing a bit of what the nations around them were doing. A high place was a place where you worshipped a God. Maybe he was doing this because there was no temple. We're not sure. There's a lot of Solomon's story that we kind of have to fill in some of the gaps. But what we do know is that one night Solomon goes to sleep and he has this dream. And I don't know about you, I read the story and I'm like, God, can I please have this happen to me? Because God comes to him in the night and says, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. Has anyone ever read this story and gone, please, please, God, can you please ask me that question? Because I, I really want to answer. I've got, a, I've got a few things I could say. Um, Solomon gets this dream and God says, what do you want? Anything you want. Now, it's interesting, God doesn't actually say, I'll give it to you. He just says, ask me what you want me to give you. Maybe he's just hearing him out. Um, I'm not sure. But Solomon has this opportunity. And of course, he doesn't ask for wealth. He doesn't ask for lots of fame. He doesn't ask for his enemies to be vanquished under his foot. He, he asks for wisdom. And this is another thing that maybe suggests he was, he was young. He says, God, get, I, I need discernment to know how to lead these people. I want to make good choices. I want to make wise choices. I want to be a king who leads with integrity and wisdom. So can you, can you give me wisdom? And as the story goes on, God says, hey, because you asked for this and not the other stuff, I will give you this. But I will also not just give you wisdom and discernment, I will also give you the things you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you fame. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David, your father did, I will give you a long life. So, so far, we're up to 1 Kings chapter 3. How many times have we had this reminder to do what his dad did? Like, it's, it's just this thing that repeats early on in his story. And Solomon has heard it. He's been reminded of it by God, by David. And now he's, he's this young man who has the wisdom of God in his life. And we hear this story that he makes this incredibly wise ruling with the two mums guessing, hey, who, whose baby died here. You can read the story in chapter 3. But what I find interesting is that when you look at what Solomon asked for and what God gave him, it sounds very similar to the advice that Jesus gave to his disciples and to us. I want to get back a second. It's not in there. But Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, you know the verse, it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else you need will be given to you. Doesn't that sound a lot kind of how David, how God interacted with Solomon? It's like, what do you want? I want wisdom. Okay, I'll give you wisdom, but I'll give you other things as well because you asked for that. Jesus says, if you seek God's kingdom first, I'll give you that, plus whatever else you might happen to need as you go along in your life. So, Solomon, king, he's got his wife, he's got his wisdom, he's making wise rulings, and he's got this, um, this kingdom around him. And 
And as he starts governing and ruling his kingdom, he also spends time exploring nature and the created world. And it, we're told that he, he just loved exploring what was in nature. And it says, because of the insight that God gave him, end of chapter four, he just, he just knew everything about everything. Plants, insects, animals. And as you go through Proverbs, you can see that there's, he, he has all these Proverbs that include parts of nature. And I, I wonder how often would you find Solomon just like for an hour exploring ants? Like we'd go, what are you doing? And he's like, but if you look at this, you can see how, how they work together. You can, see, you can see how life can happen in this small colony. And he would have brought out these amazing insights from watching ants or other animals or plants growing in the cracks of the walls. And in all of this, when you read through Proverbs, one of the things he keeps saying is the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Proverbs, I think it's, it's mentioned about three or four times in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and this repeats itself. It's as if Solomon has discovered that when you obey God, that's where your wisdom comes from. That's the beginning of your wisdom. So we move on a bit more in his story. And Solomon has all these officials. And this is, this is pretty cool. When you look at his officials, his palace, the people that he looked after, it actually tells us what he, like the daily provisions that they went through. So um, check this out. When he has all his people get together, the daily things that they need. So I I'd, I'd changed it a little bit. It gave us the amounts. You put those amounts and work out how much you can make from each thing. Every, every day, 5,000 pizzas. They didn't eat pizza, but they had enough flour to make 5,000 pizzas. Enough to make 120,000 pita breads. I'm not sure how much hummus maybe they made, but it would have been a lot. Enough for 18,000 beef patties, 28,000 beef curries, almost 3,500 kebabs. I mean, who is eating all this stuff? He must, have had, he must have been feeding everybody that was remotely attached to him. A real sense of generosity may be coming through there. Plus, there's some other things that he, we don't get numbers on. But there's this, there's this extravagance and this wealth and this this grandness to the way that he lived. And that extends to what he does next. See, David wanted to build a temple. God said, no, your son can do it. And so Solomon takes on the task of building this temple, this place where God could dwell, where they could worship God, where they would no longer need the high places, where they could come together in this one place and they could worship God there. And so he takes on the challenge of building the temple. And that's, that's a good part of the story that we get of Solomon in the Bible. How he did it, what he did, who else was involved. One of the things we are told is what was involved in building it, the materials. There was a lot of gold and a lot of silver. And that's if you put the amount of gold there was into today's terms. It's a lot of money that they put into this place where they could have this beautiful building where God could dwell. And so, yes, Solomon had wisdom. Obviously, Solomon had wealth. He builds this temple. And as he's built the temple and they consecrate it and dedicate it to God, God says this to him. As for this temple you are building, if you, sound familiar? If you follow my decrees, observe my laws, and keep all my commandments and obey them, I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David, your father. Another reminder of how God's called him to live. And so he builds a temple. It takes seven years. He then builds his palace, which takes 13 years. Maybe something's starting to shift in his life. We're not sure. But this palace is pretty impressive as well. And, and as he finishes his palace, 
we get another, ver- in, another kind of inclusion that, that comes in, another word from God that comes to him. And it says, as for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I commanded and observe all my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. Are you getting the picture here? <laughs> like deja vu every two or three chapters as you go through Solomon's story. Again and again and again, this, this gets repeated. And it goes on because this time God says, but if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I've given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, if there's other things that take the place of me in your life, I'll cut off Israel from the land I've given them and I'll reject this temple I've consecrated for my name. God's saying, hey, I want you to follow. I want you to obey. But if you don't, you're stepping outside of an area that I can no longer be with you in that space. Obedience connected them to God. And when they were in that space, God's presence brought goodness. Now, how that looks for us today might be different. It doesn't mean always you're going to be protected. It doesn't mean that always life is going to go well. But even when life isn't going well, God's presence brings goodness. It brings peace. It brings comfort. It brings a hope for what might come next. And so Solomon, he builds his temple. God dwells there. He builds his palace. He dwells there. And then we have more examples of his wisdom. Queen of Sheba arrives. She brings a whole bunch of stuff for him. He shows her around. She asks him all these questions and he answers them and she's amazed. Solomon gives her more stuff than she gave him. And she goes home going, wow, he is, yeah, he's pretty smart. He's pretty switched on. And as a result of that, there's this... uh, kind of imagine that there's this rumor that starts spreading around the nations. Hey, have you, have you heard Solomon? You should go check him out. Like, he's got some profound stuff to say. It's, it's worth the six-month trip to get there. And, and, and so it tells us that people came from all over the world to come and listen to Solomon and to hear his wisdom. It's not just his wisdom, though. He's, he's got a fair bit of wealth. Every year, um, he'd get around two billion, that's B, two billion dollars worth of gold, plus other income from other people. Yeah, that kind of doesn't really matter a lot. Um, he'd get some silver. Yeah, who cares? It says silver was like the stones on the ground. Like it was just everywhere. This was a period of Israel's history where there was peace. There was serious prosperity. And everything seems to just be going really well. He had 12,000 horses, which he brought from Egypt. Um, If you're into horses, that's a lot of horses. That's a lot of money to spend on horses. But he just had whatever he wanted. God promised, I'll give you wisdom, but I'll also give you wealth. I'll also give you fame. We see all those things playing out. And then we get to chapter 11 of 1 Kings. And the story starts to shift. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides his wife. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, please don't do this. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast in love to them. How many? 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. Um, I was reading um, uh, uh, Barack Obama's biography and he he recalls this discussion he has with the king of um, Saudi Arabia before he passed away, King Abdullah. And it was well known that King Abdullah had 12 wives. And Obama said to him, how do you manage that? And the king said, oh, it's a nightmare. 
They're all, one's always jealous of the other one. He said, it's more difficult than Middle East politics. 12, try 700. Solomon had these wives, and I think the saddest verse in all of 1 Kings is this one. His wives led him astray. And it raises this question, what happened? Solomon was given all this wisdom. He was, he was told repeatedly and reminded repeatedly, if you obey me, if you follow me, if you keep my decrees, I'll be with you, I'll go with you. But somewhere along the way, he all of a sudden wasn't. And look, we don't know if, we don't know if maybe he thought that his wisdom was enough to convert his wives to follow Israel's God. We don't know if he just got distracted, if he lost track, if we don't know what happened. But obviously something happened in his life where what he intended to set out doing was all of a sudden no longer the thing he was doing. And I don't know if you can relate to that, but I can. You have great intentions. Your, your walk with God is tight and solid and strong. And then six months later, you're like, hmm, yeah, no, I, it's been a while since we talked. Slow drift, intentional choice, other distractions coming in like 700 wives. I don't know, but it's easy to happen. It's easy to do. Solomon had all this wisdom, but at some point he forgot how to apply it. He forgot how to use it in his life. Frederick Buchner said this, King Solomon was among the wisest of fools who ever wore a crown. That's a pretty harsh statement, but maybe there's truth to it. If you were given wisdom from God, wouldn't you want to use that to stay connected to God? We don't know exactly when Ecclesiastes was written. I wouldn't be surprised if it's towards the end of Solomon's life. Because if you read through Ecclesiastes, ugh, it's, it's a dark book. Um, it starts off with, everything's meaningless. Makes no sense. Doesn't matter. In chapter 2, the teacher who we think most likely is Solomon says this, Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what good was, what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs of water to water groves of flourishing trees. I brought male and female slaves, and, and I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone else in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delight of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. How many people have this fear that they'll get to the end of their lives and go, to what end? What did I do? What difference did I make? What did I achieve? What impact did I have on those around me? Solomon had everything he could ask for. And in spite of that, and all the wisdom he had, he still reached this place where he went, I don't really know. 
it seems meaningless. And then we get to chapter 12. These are the last words in Ecclesiastes. And he says this. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, whether every, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. Now, as I was thinking through this, these are the things that came to my mind. It seems like Solomon's suggesting life is meaningless because at the end of the day, God's going to do what God does. And God's going to judge. And from Solomon's perspective, I wonder if all that he experienced, all that he had done, all that he knew about, but maybe perhaps didn't do, he sees that and he goes, I don't know how this is going to end. I don't know if this is good news or bad news. And I wonder if that's because he didn't have a relationship with God that helped him see what God was wanting to do in the world. Perhaps like his father David did. I wonder if Solomon couldn't see that God's plan was going to come, that there was going to be a Messiah, that there was going to be hope, that there would be someone who would help with this challenge that he had with, with this concept of, of judgment. Because remember what he said early on, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you have respect and obedience to God, that is where your wisdom will come from. He started with that, but he didn't end with that. So what happened? What happened along the way? I want to jump into the New Testament for a second, because there's a, a verse which might help us understand this and learn some lessons from, from Solomon. In the book of 1 John, chapter 4, it says this, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete in us so that we all have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like who? Jesus. So there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. What was Jesus like? What was Jesus like when he was on earth? Because it says we are like Jesus. Well, we know that he walked with God. We know that he was loved by God. We know that he was obedient to God. We know that he was accepted by God. And we know that he was perfectly good. How are we like that? Well, when you accept Jesus, you take on him. You are seen by God as good. You are seen, by, you are seen as being obedient to God. You are loved by God. You get to walk with God. You're accepted by him. And God sees you as good. And so that's why there is no fear in judgment when you choose Jesus. Because there's, there's nothing to fear of the bad. Because perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. One of the things I think we learned from Solomon, which is really beautiful, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but loving obedience to God is its end. That as we, as we begin to respect and walk with God, that grows. And the wisdom we get from doing that grows us and slowly we become loving God. And as we love God, as Jesus said, you show that through obedience. And as you obey and obey and keep obeying and keep walking with God, you find yourself that in this place where you are fully obedient to what God calls because you love him. And that is what wisdom looks like. Now, I admit this is not a... This is not a preferred topic to talk about. People don't like obeying. Nobody wants to obey. Nobody wants to be told what to do. But God said how many times to Solomon? 
fear me, walk with me, keep my commands, keep my laws, because they're good for you. Because when you do that, you're staying connected to me. And when you're connected to me, I'm there with you. And that is where goodness lives. We don't like to talk about obedience because it sounds like it's legalism. I hope that Solomon's story can help you understand that obedience is not legalism. Obedience is love. If you love someone, you're willing to do what they say. If you trust them, then you trust that they are good. And when they ask you to do something, that there's a good reason behind that. And so you do that. And so I want to encourage you, as you look at the life of Solomon, as you go about your week this week, how can you obey God? It's actually a simple question, but how we apply it makes a big difference in our lives. As you read through scripture, as you do your devotional or you listen to, um, to the songs, you listen to your Bible, whatever it might be that you do to connect with God, ask this one simple question. What can I obey from what I've read? What can I obey? God, how can I obey you today? What are you calling me to do? How can I obey, obey you in that? And then be courageous enough and bold enough to actually obey, to do that. It might only be a small thing, but obedience is not some giant step. It's, it's lots of little steps. But I want to encourage you to experience more of what David experienced in his life, and that is following God, reading his word, talking with him, and then working out what, to, what do you want me to obey today, God? Because I want to follow you. I want to do what you're calling me to do.